I don't know about you folks, but I think somebody had to say it. Somebody had to talk about it. And who better to do that with than Mr. Dion from Dion Financial Freedom. Dion Talk Financial Freedom. And that is why the FIRE movement died, why it needed to go away, why it was the wrong idea at the wrong time. But uh, we're going to talk about that with Mr. Dion. How you doing, sir? Howdy. I'm doing good. Thanks for letting uh, us talk about this topic on here because... The people who take in this content, who are hunting for these videos, may not think that the fire movement died. But I want them to take a second and look at blog posts and videos from 2017 to 2019 from Meet Kevin, Graham Stephan, Mr. Money Mustache, even Minority Mindset, and how much attention they got, how many hundreds of thousands of views a video would get. Now, you flash forward a few years. And they still get views. Graham Stephan switched into <clears throat> his skill set, right? He'll he'll react to and entertain. And every now and then he does a fundamental finance video that that's what I'll jump in and watch. Meet Kevin got really big because of <clears throat> stimulus, right? Throughout the pandemic, he did all the stimulus videos. Minority Mindset's still pretty big. But there's a couple of reasons why it's crashing. When the fire movement first came out, it was... <clears throat> Here are the sacrifices you can make to not have to work again. You can retire early, be financially independent. If you ride a bike to work, if you house hack, if you um, get your meals down to $2 a meal per person, like, like all of these really extreme things that to us seem like, well, yeah, if you do that, it'd be much faster. It'd be stable. If you can get your expenses down, it's easier to reach financial freedom. But that kind of hit popularity with people who hadn't heard it before. But in order to grow the number of people watching, imagine how watered down it had to be. And actually, the reason I thought of this topic is because of a comment that was just shared on one of our recent videos on your channel. The first sentence of, of this uh, person's comment on your channel was, I love a lot of what was said here. But I felt the sentiment was that of, you can only be wealthy if you sacrifice along the way. <laughs> yes. But that's exactly the sentiment, the point. Um, and, and so to expand the fire movement into more and more people to view it, it had to be, how do you answer the question of people that say, I have a terrible credit score, very low income, no money, a lot of bad debt. How can I reach financial freedom in six months with none of my own money? So to get people to watch, a lot of the content creators said, well, of course it's easy. Here's the get rich quick schemes that you can use. And so as it spread and got more watered down to hit a broader audience, the impact of reaching financial freedom without sacrifice is basically just being a little more frugal. So the fire movement died because it became so mainstream to hit the average person who's not willing to sacrifice, mm -hmm. who thinks that sacrificing would be too hard for a short period of time to have a better reward afterwards. And I only see this getting, I don't want to say worse, but more watered down, more simplified systems that you can have everything you want and reach financial freedom, right? Uh, there's a lot of times people talk about the four percent rule and for a few years uh creators like graham stuff and me kevin were saying ah, with inflation it might be the 3.5 percent rule right i kind of thought okay i'm not a stock guy that seems to make sense and then about a month ago maybe two months dave ramsey says ah let's go with the eight percent rule more people will invest if they think <laughs> that we money to four is not enough let's go to eight they let's don't have eight, enough right? money let's go to eight. Oh, there that's some good math it hits a broader audience. It draws more people in. And if they're the, if you're the content creator, not like the three amigos or millennial Mike, where financial freedom happened through real estate and hey, here's YouTube. Let's let's share it with people. And yeah, it'd be nice to make a couple hundred bucks a month off of YouTube. That'd be cool. Versus the the Ramsey Corp, whose income source is selling products about how to make money. It's gonna get worse. People are going to start thinking of more and more ways for the, I call myself the lazy investor, but people don't realize the lazy is the motivation to take a lot of extreme action for five to 10 years so that you can then play online video games every single day. 
<laughs> and not feel unproductive. Take an afternoon nap most days. Most, most. I'm trying to think. If there's a day where I don't have a nap, that's a bad day. Yeah, it's a bad day. Yeah, I agree with you. I think there's a couple of things when I think about the fire movement. So let, let's rewind the clock a little bit. So I retire in 2018, February of 2018. Uh, I think his name was Money Mustache. I believe he had just retired, or maybe he had left a year or so earlier. I had just started following. So fire movement is all over the place. In fact, as my channel was starting, I was getting attacked by people in the fire movement because I was, hey, the real estate guy, right? And for whatever reason, a lot of the early fire movement folks were anti-real estate, right? They were, you know, save money, put it in stocks, index funds, you know, live like a miser and, you know, eventually you'd be okay. Uh, I, I think it was 2021. It might've been 2022. He had to go back and get a job, right? Life happened. Right. That's the other thing I think that's really cute. Right. I, I think that was thing... the economic ninja. Oh, maybe. No, no, no. It was the big. Was, was him too? Thing. Okay. I missed that yeah. part. It's because I yeah. remember Peter, but yeah, I didn't know he went back to work. So, so, so maybe it's another guy. Anyways, it was another big fire guy who made a big deal about quitting and, and he was going to be a coach and do all these other things that really fulfilled him. Long story short, it sounded good when he was single. He got married, had two kids. Now he's going back to work. So it is one thing to live on a fire movement with ramen noodles and, you know, Costco handouts. But when you get married, when you have kids, all of that can change. The other thing that I think the fire movement died is it, it didn't welcome other ideas. The fact that I was attacked when I, I wasn't, I didn't even really know the fire movement. The fact that they found me and just threw darts without context was really shocking they they really they really made it about if you're not sacrificing in biking to work or walking or whatever you're not in the club and i was like i don't know what you guys are talking about there's lots of ways to get here if you actually listen to my story i cut 50 percent of my expenses needs versus wants out so i'm there and oh by the way hint I'm through the cycle. I'm 15 years in. I, I'm I'm somebody you could point to as like, hey, look, it works. There's more than one way to do it. And now I've been out for six years and have no intention to go back. It it was wild to see. It seemed like the fire movement folks got tighter and tighter as opposed to opening their arms to other ideas. That was a huge mistake. That um, aggressiveness is still there. It's just shifted. Right. Originally, I remember several times going into the like choose FI community or the uh, it, even even the afford anything where Paula Pant has seven properties. And, like that's how she reached financial freedom. And then she grew a really good brand on how other people can do this. Early on, it was anti real estate. Mm -hmm. It was if it's not stocks, if it's not the four percent rule, that's not financial freedom. Now it shifted to, OK, that might be financial freedom. But this is from a comment from yesterday. So this is not like. A couple of years ago, people were saying this, but yesterday, that's not passive enough for me. They have no idea how passive it can be or can't be. They just assume all I've heard about real estate is how tenants, toilets, and termites can become a headache versus have 180 units, but a property manager two and a half hours away and then move out of state and still yeah. be that passive to it. Or with me, the, the right amount of cash flow with the least amount of units, it takes two hours a month to self-manage 18 units. The only thing more passive would be laying in an iron lung so you don't even have to breathe for yourself. Yeah, and, exactly. And to me, it's much more passive to own the real estate than to invest in stocks. So I've never had a property go from a valuation of 6 billion to zero mm -hmm. because of an online credit or an online hack. Everybody should just go quickly Google 23andMe and see what happened in the last couple of months. Yeah, That doesn't happen in real estate. Yes, you can have rents come down. It's entirely possible. You can have property values come down. But this is why we invest for a certain yield. We maximize and stabilize as we're going along. We have reserves. We diversify our portfolio. We diversify the tenant types. And keep you do. You have some Section 8, some not. I have some Section 8, some not, some military. I keep my properties at least 10 miles apart close to different economic drivers. Fire and forget, once they're in place, I don't have to watch what's happening with crypto yeah. or the stock market. 
Yeah, the other thing about the fire movement that really that really doesn't it just doesn't click is something you talked about, but I think it warrants another discussion. It's it's just rigorous sacrifice for years. And it's just it doesn't fit with the you know if you look at a bell curve, right? There are only a certain percentage of folks who are wired to do that. And and frankly, probably happy, right? Because I think you have to be happy, right? If, at the end of the day, you spent three dollars and twelve cents. You're probably if you're if you're wired for today's fire movement, you're excited because it was less than your five dollar budget. Most people are going to go through the day looking at spending three dollars and twelve cents and be miserable. Uh, and then if you tell them you got to do that for 17 years, it's like, I'm out, too hard, too long, not for me. So it doesn't, the thing that I've learned about getting financial freedom is the first five years suck, right? It, it, the best analogy is that snowball going downhill. The first, getting it, getting the movement started hard then it just takes a while to pick up steam and get big enough, A, to recognize, and then B, to be meaningful enough to even consider being done. It's years. And I don't think the FIRE movement, at least my early attacks, um, didn't acknowledge that. It was almost like, do this and you'll be free. I'm like, really? You think it's that easy? It's kind of kind of wild. So we talk often about how the first five years are going to suck. And 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 and. When the fire movement came out, it was the people who, I can live off grid. I can live super frugally. And if I do this, I'm financially free, financially independent. I can retire and I need, need a job. Well, then it spread out. Like I said, it gets to a bigger audience, so it needs to be watered down. So we talk about those five years sucking. There are people who think, okay, if you eat top ramen and rice for five years, you're going to save a bunch of money. That's not what we mean by the first five years sucks. Here's what I mean every time I say it. For two years, I moved from my house into an apartment. I rented my house out. So I moved into an apartment. Like that's a downgrade. Most people think that hedonic treadmill says never move backwards in life, but sometimes a backward sacrifice can help. Was life any actually worse living in an apartment with the, the weight room, the hot tubs, the pool, the you know closer, less commute? It wasn't worse. It was just a step back. For those two years, I worked overtime. How many people are working overtime right now anyway? I worked a side hustle playing World of Warcraft, selling things online. I saved. And here's why it sucked. Because it didn't take a lot of action. Mm -hmm. I didn't invest in, I didn't dollar cost average stocks every couple of days to watch numbers change. I didn't buy a bunch of rentals in the first year. I was getting my debt to income ratio right by getting rental income on my tax returns. By staying in the same new field, I was starting to be, I was a CDL instructor and it was a change. So lenders didn't like that for two years. So lining all of these things up so that in two years I can buy a duplex and then do that for two more years, right? Those first five years suck because in four years I did two things. If you look at like what, what actual impact happened, not the daily discipline of doing the work every day to save, to increase income, to study my market, to be ready for that purchase, right? All of those things were happening, but the actual dopamine hit was I've got one duplex. I'm now house hacking. Here's how much I'm saving from doing that. That's why it sucks. I still, I've never had a budget. Yeah. Even even I, when I was living frugally. I want to poke at that a little bit. I want to poke at your first four years because we talk about two big events, right? Buying the first one, buying the second one. But just like the fire movement, I believe if that's all we're talking about, that's too far away for most people, right? They don't, it's just, we're not wired that way. The matrix doesn't let us do that. But what I hear you saying is you were taking incremental action, certainly monthly and probably weekly, that you can go back and point at, right? For example, I don't even know you, I didn't even know you could sell stuff in whatever that is, Witch of Warcraft or whatever the hell that thing is. Um, A, how much money do you think you collected in total over the four years? Just for, just for skin. What do, what do you think the total was? Collected, you mean from overtime and side hustle and everything? No, just, just the video game part. What do you oh, think? it so it was somewhere between three and five hundred dollars a month. So I'd have to do the math on that. My my good so month five, was five hundred dollars. Okay, let's say four hundred bucks. So four hundred times twelve is four forty eight hundred a year, and you did that for four years, roughly. Yep. So that's roughly twenty grand. 
Right. Yep. And then you factor in overtime. Yeah. With then that dropping. was the next pile. And but I yeah. want to go back to the video game. I don't care if it's Etsy, like brick, like Casey with brick by brick, or any of these other things. We just talked about. You bought a duplex after two years and then another one after two years being too far apart. So what I would do in my broken world is I have this spreadsheet that I share with people every Sunday, what I'm doing, right? So what I would do is I would have a, I would have a column or a row that says, I don't know, what are they called? Like gadgets or what, what are you selling? Uh, uh, for the, the only game, I, I don't even know. Yeah, I, I'm way out of my depths here because I don't play uh, video games. In-game items. Okay, so I would have I would have a row called in game items in in game items, and I would probably set a weekly goal. I would probably set it at a hundred bucks, and then I would track that every week. The reason I do that, the reason I think it is important, is two years or four years and two accomplishments is too far for most people. But if we work in a world where we are giving ourselves incremental progress every freaking week towards this bigger goal, it gets addictive. It gets something we look forward to. It is something that we keep working on, right? How many people would give up at month 13 of getting their credit right, getting the D? It's just like, I give up. This is too hard. I'm not there yet. I've, I've done everything I can. But if you track it weekly and you see the progress weekly, it's easier. So in line with the people who quit, a lot of times we hear about people who acquire their first rental and they have one bad tenant and then they yeah. just basically sell it. They call everybody and they say, hey, I tried it. I didn't like it. Yeah. For me, what's confusing for me about that is it's not that they just bought a rental and then they had a bad experience. Is that they did the work that it takes to be able to buy a rental. Like the solid credit history, the bankability, the studying the market, the saving the down payment, closing costs, money for immediate repairs, like all of that work that went in to then have one bad experience tell them that they should quit. And I think that kind of happens with the fire movement. Mm. People think all of the things that I have to do and then and learn how to do this whole new skill set, then right. the reward is still years away. So I, I think um, I like your spreadsheet idea take it right from business you know nothing can be improved until it's measured yeah you gotta measure once you, once, you, once you measure it you can improve it and i think that applies to your daily routines yeah um, i actually recently just met with my son and put him on blast here on youtube that's great <laughs> he was the typical like i was at his age um, um idiot in their 20s and racked up student loan debt and car right debt so, got a motorcycle sold a motorcycle for a bike had fifty four thousand dollars in consumer debt student Ooh. loan debt then Ouch. pulls off a genius move, something I have yet to do, married up, and found somebody with a brain. And the two of them worked together. And within one year, zero debt, they got down to zero. The problem is going from I have consumer debt to zero is easier than going from zero to I have net worth. Because Ooh. when you're bringing down debt, when you're bringing down debt, you have a target. The zero is I could pay fourteen dollars off of this bill. My numbers are closer to the goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As soon as they hit zero, it it went in, and this is not to put my son on blast, like I said, but they went into la la land of yeah. oh we have five grand new car, oh we have ten grand Disneyland trip, oh we, we could probably save ten grand in the next year. Oh let's do Japanese Disneyland, right? The, the, so he came over last week and he said, look, I I I think I watched one of your videos and I fell into this trap where I knew how to get to zero. And as soon as we passed that, it all fell apart. So we sat down and we said, well, how do you, how do you do this? So we created a, a, you know, a new chart saying, here's what goals look like when it is progressing towards the next first duplex or whatever. So now I'm getting updates on things he's done to improve that and how he's doing that. So I'm excited about that. But I think that's a trap that most of us fall into, especially when it comes to um, financial freedom says, well, you don't want debt, right? So the first step is you don't want debt. Then some people realize I want good debt, right? Yeah. I don't and mind debt. It's just what kind? <laughs> what kind of debt, right? And so not everybody makes that leap. There are some Dave Ramsey fans out there who reach financial freedom, who use the 4% rule. Who By all means. Do all of it. It's totally possible. It, it's over a longer timeline. Um, but once you get rid of the debt, it's that next. When I when I started and I thought, okay, I want to buy a, a single family house was my original goal. And it's it shifted to small multifamily. I had to sit down and think, okay, 
what can I save every month at my current spending? Okay, how many months would it take to acquire this, this, or this, you know, down payment, closing costs, or even an emergency fund when I was starting? And, and then sit back and go, okay, so that's the month's long plan. And, and originally, I don't think I had a 10-year plan to retire. I had a 10-year plan to make work optional because mm. my original problem was my pensions kept getting taken away. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the, the one thing about the fire movement dying is I think, like a lot of things, at its core, it had a lot of good good things. And it's probably why it grew so fast, right? It was so addictive. It, it, it painted a vision. It also did a great job of painting a vision of, hey, you don't have to make a lot of money. One thing I do love about the fire movement, what it got right, is it was about replacing your, your spending. And if anybody's heard heard our stories over time, if you if you can get two x or three x or in your case four x your what you required a month, you're free. I think there's a lot of folks out there that think you have to make six figures or multiple six figures, and I want people to hear me. It is harder, without question, to retire financially free when you make six figures when you're starting, versus making fifty grand. Most people don't think that's true. It is out without question harder. So I think the fire movement got that right. I I, I totally agree. Uh, I've had I've seen some comments in the threads recently where people were saying, "Hey, I, I want to retire on you know a million or less or five hundred thousand or less." There's a couple of YouTube channels that are doing really good. Like the name of their channel is "Retiring on Five Hundred Thousand Dollars or Less" because it's possible and people do oh, it. Oh yeah. The challenge we run into, and I've seen this in a recent interview on Bigger Pockets Money. Not recently. This is what this a few months ago. The lady who wrote Your Money or Your Wife, Your Life. Or or this it was one of those books. Forget the name. Basically said $10 million is not enough to retire on. And it was this disconnect between somebody who's super successful, kind of like when you interviewed Graham Stephan. He's like, I'm making hundreds of thousands or millions a month or a year, whatever it is. And I, it can go away tomorrow. Yeah. Like as the numbers get bigger, our brain starts thinking bigger is not enough. And, and it's, this is where I get kind of a lot of flack from other investors. I knew what enough was, right? Yeah, I, I Clearly. But I, I think that is one thing that I, I could say about both of us is we, I think there's a financial mountain, financial freedom mountain, whatever you want to call it with a lot of outcroppings. We found a number that was comfortable for us and we freaking sat down. We're done. Now, I've said many times, and I'm sure you have, I reserve the right to change my opinion and stand back up and walk up higher. But I, I've been here for six years. I'm good, right? The view's great. I'm reaching down and helping people up. Someday I may stand up and go higher, but I, I agree. There are so many people that just throw out stupid big numbers with no context. It's just ten million dollars is not enough. Are you kidding me? I mean, come on. Yeah, that's what I said when I heard it too. So, uh, to, to to continue on your point where you said, you know, we, we picked the number on the mountain, but you reserve the right to change your mind in the future, right? Mm -hmm. Here's here's the way I look at that, and and I heard this um, recently as well in relation to the four percent rule. A lot of people look at the four percent rule and they think, okay. Um, the reason I'm doing this is because this accounts for inflation. This accounts for me paying taxes. This accounts for all of the other things that can happen. But they rarely account for what when, what happens in the year where you have a 20% return or a 30% return, right? So in real estate, I use that multiplier. I make, it's making more than four times what it costs me to live so that I can handle a recession, a prolonged government shutdown, a, a pandemic or whatever's going to happen that could that could impact that can have a serious health concern that four time multiplier covers that mm -hmm. where i reserve the right is what i did like with my most recent purchase i did not need to buy this duplex but since i haven't had a major health concern rents haven't gone down the pandemic we had actually increased net worth and and rents across the board at, by the second or third year into it right so this this exponential growth that's happened the extra money can be deployed just because I know that's my number that I'm at. I'll, I'm totally fine there. Yeah. I'll house hack another duplex. Yeah. Another another thing that I think uh, people have a problem with the fire movement is you have to be frugal forever. Mm. And, and that's not, I wouldn't do the, I wouldn't have retired early if I had to be frugal forever. What I did no. was 
retired early and then try to figure out how to spend money. Like mm-hmm. that's the actual challenge. Yeah. Again, I think, I think there was a lot to like about the fire movement. I think it was a sexy sell. Uh, I do think the, I don't call it the leaders or principals, whatever you want it. They got too rigid. Uh, and I want to be clear, right? One of the things about one rental at a time I'm trying to do is be open, right? Obviously you and I and, and Matt and Mike and, and many of the others on the channel got there via real estate. So what have I done purposely on this channel is I brought two stock guys, in, right? Taylor from Life Goal Investments, Dan, uh, you know, uh, that he does. And also I'm trying to do a better job of bringing on small businesses. I'm not going to sit here and say real estate is right for everyone. I'll tell you it was right for me, but it's not right for everyone. If you're an entrepreneur like Omar down south or, you know, you want to do something with Bo uh, and get a small business loan and buy a franchise or I go for it. I'm not, I, there's a lot of ways to get there, but the core is you have to create discretionary income. You have to become elite at something and you have to do it for a freaking decade. Those don't change, whether it's stocks, real estate, or small businesses. If they would have, that's what the fire movement should have been. Create disposable income, invest those things in something and do it for a decade. That's it. That's all it takes. And I'm I'm actually curious to see where the fire movement goes. When we say that it, it's it's dead, it's 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 getting a lot less views. Like that's that's the metric I have to to look at it. It does seem like a lot more people are familiar with it, and mm-hmm. on like a topical sense. Right. A, a mistake I made in the very beginning, but and I don't know if I've said this before, but I had the Rich Dad Poor Dad book for about five or six years before I ever opened it. <laughs> I used to tell people, oh yeah, I've I got it. He was talking about he's got a rich dad and a poor dad. Totally understand it. (laughs) And then after my first failed year in real estate, absolutely falling on my face, I thought, I should probably open that thing. I should probably read that book. (laughs) Right. Oh, that is so funny. That is so funny. So yeah, again, I think I I, what I hope people, if they're this far in the video, understand is I don't care what your thing is. If you're still on the fire movement, God bless you. Uh, don't attack others because they did it different. I am trying to be open to the other ideas. I do think getting wealthy, and again, I I really think you can get wealthy making 50 or 60 grand a year. I do think it's easier, frankly. Uh, I think high school seniors could be wealthy in five years. Again, wealthy being passive income greater than your required expenses if they did it right. Create discretionary income. Buy assets to produce cash flow. Do it for a decade. And at the end of the day, I don't care what the middle step is. Do whatever, do whatever your thing, whatever lights you on fire, whatever excites you, do that. That works for me. Have you, have, are you familiar with the, the Socrates format for debating? Mm-mm. Okay. So each side has to present the other side's opinion Ooh. to the other side's satisfaction. And then you can debate it. So I can't say, here's my thoughts. I have to say, here's, here's what you're saying. Let me, let me summate it in, in a way that you understand. And then when that person goes, you nailed it. Now I can debate it. Okay. So that's the Socrates. Okay. It's, it's probably a better way of saying it. So let me try to say, and not to debate, but see if I got this clear so that people can understand. When you say it's probably easier to reach financial freedom if you're making $50,000 a year than if you're making $150,000 a year. Here's what I think you mean. Correct me if I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. If you're making $50,000 a year, you live on a kind of tight budget. You have You don't have the ability to have life creep take over. And so when you increase your income, you can stay at that level easier to now deploy that funds versus when you have $150,000. Like some people that I know who have always asked me, how come you don't own a million dollar house? You totally can own a million dollar house. And my response has always been, I could buy a million dollar house because I haven't. (laughs) So the $150,000 person is thinking, okay, at my level of life, at my peers' opinions, I have to have this nicer car. The nicer car needs uh, means I need to have the better driveway to put it. I'm not going to park this sixty thousand dollar car in an apartment complex. I'm going to have my own driveway, so I have to have a house. If I have to have a house, it's got to be the right size for the kids I plan on having. And then I want all of the wants that come in because of the earn the, the level of income. Is that the idea of why financial freedom is easier at fifty thousand? 
with one addition. So all of that is correct. Usually people come to this desire at some point in their adult life. So whatever you are, you have already made financial commitments that you can't undo. So if you're making 50 grand a year, those additional commitments are limited. If you're making 200 grand a year, they're larger. Whether it's like your son who had credit card debt or student loan or whatever, just the hole that you have to fill in is smaller if you're capped out at 50 versus 200. With that one addition, I like all of it. I thought of two, two reasons where it makes sense too. If you're making $50,000 a year and you lose your job, you find another $50,000 a year job. Quick. If you're making 150 and tech lays off across the board, you're learning a new skill. My friend, uh, Tony, Captain Sags, I think he's Major Sags now, uh, worked for Blizzard, World of Warcraft, right? So I'm a fan, but he's also yeah. a friend of mine, comes to our local uh, real estate meetup. He's house hacking a duplex, like he's, he's on the right path. Uh, when I met him, he was into crypto, that shifted. Uh, mm -hmm. But he recently, Blizzard laid off 1,900 people. Yeah. I sent him a message this morning. He said, look, I don't know what you made. I know getting laid off sucks. Uh, and I don't work for the school anymore, so there's no benefit to me. But do you know that when you get laid off, you might be able to go get this thing called WIOA funds, where the government will pay you to get a CDL. You can go get a seventy or $80,000 a year local driving job. Try to help them out. But a driver that loses their job goes and drives for another company. That tech guy, they kind of lay off at the same time. So that's the the first reason is it's, it's easier to replace that lower income. And the second reason, if you're making 150 and somebody's making 50, most people just think, okay, those are big difference numbers. This person's making more. What college debt did it take to get the 150? Right? What what high cost of living area do you need to live in to get the wage of 150? There's some other things that can impact those wages too. So for the people that are watching that are only making 50,000 a year, which is what I made for the first eight years of investing. So it was actually a little easier for my rental income to pass my uh, earned income because of that. Yeah. I'm just curious. Did you see the fireworks explode yeah. behind your head? Sometimes Zoom loves me that much. How did that happen? That so, was great. Uh, hands up like it, it won't. It'll time it and it won't do it over a period of time. Time my hands up like this. Tap yourself in the chest and it'll sometimes do that. Okay. But it's got to be like more than a minute since it just did it. Ah, or else okay. it do a thumbs up, a couple of other things. But it times it so it's not flooding at all. It's I had no idea that folks, did you know there were hand signals for Zoom? These are these are exciting things. I did not know that. But oh, I digress. Right turn. I think you're absolutely right. Again, I I want I want people to I want people to realize this. A high income is harder. And if you ever need proof of this, I will play the cash flow game with Robert Kiyosaki. You will be the doctor or the lawyer. I will be the teacher or the police officer. And I'll kick your ass nine out of 10 times. It's not even close. I will be out of the game in 30 minutes and it might take you two hours. If if, I, if if the Rich Dad Corporation wouldn't sue us for plagiarism, I think we should play a rich, you know, a cash flow live Zoom game between the yeah. performance of tears with Mike. I think there's an online version. I don't, I think we, we might be able to do that. In which case, I have the game. We're going to all be in Vegas soon enough. We'll film us playing it. Maybe. I don't know. It's, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. There you, go. there you go. Well, at the end of the day, folks, financial independence, retire early is possible. Um, it's funny. I, it, my first LLC, I don't know if I've ever said this. The first LLC I ever created, it no longer exists. So I'll say it here, was RY. R R holdings. There was a rich dad, poor dad book. I read after rich dad, poor dad called retire young, retire rich. That book came out before the fire movement took off, but that book it's, it's a picture of Robert and Kim on a horse that I remember like on the back cover. Uh, I actually read that book more than I read rich dad, poor dad, because it was more of a how to book. Um, but yeah, fire, financial independence, retire really is possible. Uh, there are lots of ways to do it. Uh, I am, I'm all for it. Whatever your thing is, I do think it's three steps, discretionary income, become elite, invest, you know, do it for a decade. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I, real estate's not the only option. There are others. Dion, closing thoughts, where can they find you? So clothing, clothes, closing thoughts, 
there is not one right way to do this. There is a right one right way for you, awesome. which is why on my channel, because I know that there are people who want to reach financial freedom, but don't want to own a rental. I often recommend looking into stocks or owning your own business. And I'll recommend people to the channel of Joe Kuhn, K-U-H-N. He invested in stocks and uses the bucket method and a bunch mm -hmm. of stuff that I would haven't done. Uh, and But it's a viable way to reach financial freedom if you don't want to own rentals. And you can find me right here on YouTube, Dion Talk Financial Freedom. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate you. Ciao.